and we will be doing today, we will work on legal problem solving skills. Um, so our goal for the class today is to uh, walk you through a demonstration and explanation and practice of a legal problem solving method used in law schools across the world called IRAC, I-R-A-C. I will explain that carefully and maybe you've been exposed to it already. Um, so our goal is to give you a tool or uh, a template, right, uh, kind of some guideposts that you can use in any any time you face legal analysis or a legal question. Once again, a very good afternoon. We are so excited to be with you all again this afternoon, this wonderful afternoon. Your presence with us make all the afternoon so wonderful that we wait for this moment to be with you all and to share our knowledge and experience. Uh, so we are so happy to see all the cheerful faces of our uh, students who have joined in and the excitement and the curiosity which is reflecting uh, on their faces is something which motivates us to put in more efforts to make it more uh, meaningful and a learning experience for our participants. Uh, as uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Margaret, just explained uh, the agenda and the objective uh, of the session, uh, we are going to focus today's session on uh, problem solving through uh, the skill or method of IRAC. Uh, and uh, we will be learning the steps and the stages of applying IRAC and how, with the help of this skill and method, if we get comfortable with, uh, we can systematically proceed for settlement of legal dispute uh, in a more, more, more systematic manner uh, and to give you more comfort and better command and control over this method, we are going to uh, have not only the theoretical discussion along with interaction, but we will also be giving you some of the exercises uh, to, uh, to learn the practicality of the concepts which we are discussing in today's session. And for the theoretical discussion also, we will be uh, following two approaches. One is like where you start from the facts. That is when the client approaches you with a problem and you apply the IREC method, and then you come to a conclusion. And then we will be adopting and applying a, a, a reverse approach also. This is the reverse learning where we will be uh, giving you, and we have already shared a very small piece of judgment with you that, okay, if you have a judgment, how you break it into different components and uh, come back uh, and segregate the important uh, components out of it. So both the approaches will help you uh, getting a comfort in applying this method of IREC that is starting from a fact and reaching to conclusion. And the second approach is where you start from a rule and then you break, uh, segregate, break uh, the given judgment rule into different component of IREC and it should be followed by the exercises in the class itself. So again, we will be giving you exercise. We will be dividing you in the groups and both me and Margaret will be uh, visiting each of the group to see in case you are finding any difficulty in doing that exercise so that we could give for some more clarification and which will be followed by your presentation and concluded by our feedbacks. Before we start today's uh, uh, session. Uh, we wish to uh, we wish to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, the fact uh, which we came to know from the news which we watched yesterday uh, that uh, a massive earthquake hit uh, Turkey yesterday, and to acknowledge and to express our empathy. Uh, for the people who suffered huge loss uh, in this uh, natural disaster yesterday, uh, we wish to stand in solidarity by observing uh, peace uh, or silence of one minute. So we request everyone to observe one minute silence as our gesture or mark of solidarity for the person who suffered irreparable loss yesterday.
Thank you, everybody. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, I have prepared a PowerPoint uh, that I have used with my students in my university um, and that um, will show you, take you through what IRAC is, um, but don't turn off your participation voices. Um, I will be posing some questions, right? And um, there will be some slides where I will ask you what you think. Um, so um, you can uh, just raise your hand at that point and, um, and we'll call on you um, because I, I think it's, it's interesting and, and fun to discuss it as we go along. Oops. Okay. <laughs> okay, everybody, can everybody see my slides? So um, in my fashion, um, I have posed a lot of questions here. So I'm going to start the presentation by trying to get you to think, right, um, about what is the structure or design of legal analysis, right? Um, have you noticed, right, in your, in your learning, your studying of law, that there is a pattern? Um, what is the pattern that we see in legal analysis? What are the components of legal analysis? And when do we need to practice legal analysis. So we see legal analysis um, of, in a variety of examples. You may be required to do legal analysis when you're asked an exam question. You may be required to do legal analysis when you get a legal problem, right? You may be required to do legal analysis when you're reading a judgment, right, a case, Right, and you're trying to understand what the result is. So all those in all those instances, right, three different instances, we will see that there are similar components, right, that comprise that make up legal analysis. And we say that's what IRAC is. Okay, that's the structure, right, and that's a pattern. Um, I would just like to see a show of hands. Um, let's see, I'll just go to the, a show of hands. Um, who has heard of IRAC before? I R A C. I'm wondering if you have been exposed to that in any of your classes or any of your studies. If you could raise your electronic hand, that would be great. And then I will know um, if this is the first time. Okay, I see no electronic hands. Um, and, and I'm assuming everybody knows how to raise their ele electronic hand, right? <laughs> okay, so this is the first time. Okay, um, good to know. So um, this is um, a mode of analysis that's used, uh, I've seen it used in law schools across the world, so we're gonna learn it and it's not that hard. Um, so first of all, you may ask, what does the acronym stand for? The acronym stands for the four components of legal analysis. So all those examples I mentioned, right? Writing an exam, helping a client, reading a case, right? Anytime you're trying to solve a legal problem in any of those instances, these items are gonna come into play. You're going to have a legal issue. That's the question. So the way we define a legal issue is how does the legal rule apply to these facts. That's what an issue is. You're going to have a rule, right? So the legal rule could be from a statute, legislative body, or it could be from a court holding. Um, we'll leave it at that. I mean, I, I think I'm not sure there could be other sources of rules in Turkey or India, customary laws. Um, in the US, we have administrative rules. Um, there's an application, right? For example, the court explains in a case how 
the rule applies to a set of facts, and then there's a conclusion. So it's issue, rule, application, conclusion. So I'm gonna take you through an example, and I'm gonna ask you to participate a little bit um, so we can get um, a sense of, of how it goes. Um, so um, we're going to use it in a burglary problem, right, which is a, a simple kind of civil law problem. Um, and I will provide you with um, an example of a burglary statute from the United States and the state that I live in. So um, yeah, so burglary meaning somebody going into a house and stealing something, right? Um, so sometimes for us to identify the issue, right, we have to know what the rule is. So today I'm going to start out our IRAC discussion with, with the rule, the actual statute um, from my state that prohibits stealing from a house. Um, yeah, so um, we can see, right, I give you the citation here. A person is guilty of burglary in the third degree when he knowingly enters or remains unlawfully in a building with intent to commit a crime therein. I'm gonna ask for another show of hands. So I just read a rule. So this may or may not be similar to some of the legal rules you deal with, right? I'm gonna ask for another show of electronic hands. Um, who has dealt or learned um, about elements of a legal rule? Focusing on elements, uh, learning what an element is, using an element for your legal analysis. If you could raise your electronic hand, which I think you all know how to do, that would be great. Okay, um, I don't see any hands raised. So probably maybe, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you anything, but I'm thinking maybe it sounds familiar, but you haven't used it um, in your studies. Um, so um, the element, this is um, a a, a source of focus in um, legal analysis and helps us really focus and be precise with our legal analysis. So the way we would describe an element is a separate component of a legal rule. Um, uh, in other words, every rule, every legal rule, whether it's a statute, maybe it has another source, customary rule, maybe it's a case holding, has a number of components. All those components must be satisfied for the rule to apply. Right? Does that make sense? Um, so we'll just we'll take a look by example. So that's that's what we're doing here. We're going through an example to teach the concept. All right. So um, so we looked at this rule, right? Uh, I read this rule. Um, there's a number of components, separate components here. So this is not a component, right? Is guilty of burglary in the third degree. That's not a component of the rule. That can't be satisfied or unsatisfied. Right, that is just kind of a name. That's kind of the name of the crime, right? Um, so I'm just gonna ask for anybody, anybody wanna take a guess for of one element? What is one separate component of this rule that you see that would have to be satisfied for the crime of burglary to have occurred? This is a third degree, so it's, yeah. Oh, great, right. okay. Knowingly. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Knowingly. 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 Okay, let's say knowingly enters. All right, let's pair those. Very good. Then I see, um, I want to see the person at the top. Uh, stands in. Yeah, uh, intent. Intent to commit. Yeah, intent to commit a crime. Very good. Sevke. And the behavior to enter or to remain. Yes, enter or remain. Good, good, good. And then there was someone else with their hand up, but I see, someone else said with the intent. Um, okay, so you're getting the idea, very good. So let's um, go through it. So the elements would be, right? Actually a person is an element. That is our first element, even though it's so simple, right? Because let's say a dog, we had a dog. Well, if a dog does these things, it's not burglary in the third degree, right? You have to still have just the very simple element of person. So person is the first one. Um, knowingly enters, very good, we got that, um, or remains unlawfully. So either since when we have an or, right, those things are the same element because either one can apply. 
I think I saw a question from um, Sevki. Uh, is the unlawfully can be an element too? Um, I would say it would have to be, uh, it is part of an element. <laughs> so I would say that the entire element would be knowingly enters or remains unlawfully, because if a person did either of those things, right, it would satisfy the statute. So it has to be remains unlawfully. We have to know what they're doing unlawfully, right? Or knowingly enters. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's the, uh, separates the elements in Turkish law so here and locally. So that's why I asked. Thank you. Uh, you were, I, I didn't quite catch it. You were asking about the separation of the elements? Um, it is. It was just separate so, uh, in Turkey, so we just uh, focus on it separately. That's fine. Okay. So we have person knowingly enters or remains unlawfully. Then we have building, right? Very simple, but requirement building. And then we have intent to commit a crime therein. So one of the students said intent, right? So it has to be a specific kind of intent. So really we have four elements, right? Person knowingly enters or remains unlawfully, building intent to, to commit a crime therein. Those are the four elements that have to be satisfied for burglary in the third degree to occur. Um, so now we're gonna work through an example, all right? And I'll continue to ask for your participation. Um, so uh, I'm showing you a picture of, um, ancient ruins from the United States, from the Southwest, um, from the ancient Pueblo people, and uh, they were called Anasazi. So these are Anasazi ruins in the state of Colorado, which is in the Southwest. So here's our legal problem. What if Margaret, a tourist from Buffalo, spent the night in the cliff dwellings, shown here, because she intended to steal a ladder? from the dwellings. So I'm not sure um, there, if you can really see it, but um, there are some ladders kind of tucked in here and there among the doors, okay? So that is our very simple legal question, right? So I'm going to ask you, right? These are the elements that you've identified, the ones in red. I'm going to ask you, um, which element are we going to be analyzing? Asim? Uh, we don't know if this thing is a building. Very good. Very good. So we know we have a person. The facts said she entered and intentionally spent the night that she had the intent to steal a, le a ladder. Um, but we don't know if these cliff dwellings are, are uh, a building, right? Um, that's correct. Okay, so we have our first component of legal analysis, which is the issue, right? Do cliff, cliff dwellings qualify as buildings under the statute? Now, in, um, this is something we will also cover in legal research. We will um, touch on in legal research, but legal rules and statutes often have separate definitions, right? Separate uh, definitions. Um, so, um, what we would do when we, when we notice that that's the issue, right, Asim, very good, um, we would say, okay, let me check the statute and see if there are separate definitions of these elements, right? I'm going to go to the statute now. You've been presented with a question, you've correctly identified the issue, and we go to the statute and we see that um, there is a definition of building, right? So we'll read this, um, it's a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit, uh, of an older definition. In addition to its ordinary meaning, uh, this is how the building is defined. So building is defined as, in addition to its ordinary meaning, includes any structure, vehicle, or watercraft used for overnight lodging of persons or used as an elementary or secondary school or an enclosed motor truck or an enclosed motor trailer. Okay, so those are a lot of options. So there are clearly some things that we can rule out that don't apply to our situation. Right? So um, can I see some hands? What does not apply? What would not apply to our, uh, yes, Samrat? 
Yeah, so drugs and schools, obviously. So those are the two things that won't apply. Yeah, so we can just cross yeah. those off, right? I'm sorry, and you said something else at the end? Oh, and the trailer as well. Trailer, so right. trailer, exactly. Yeah. So that, that entire, the last two lines, it's not an elementary or secondary school, not in a closed motor truck, not a closed motor truck trailer. Um, so um, we have... The part of the definition that applies, right, is in addition to its ordinary meaning, right, includes any structure used as an overnight lodging for persons. So if we look up here, right, we got rid of these, we got rid of all this, does not apply. So we're left with this ordinary meaning. Oh, and also we got rid of vehicle or watercraft, right? We can get rid of vehicle or watercraft. We're not dealing with a vehicle or watercraft. So we're just dealing with ordinary meaning, um, structure, and overnight lodging of persons, right? So what I did was just include the parts of the rule that apply. So in addition to ordinary meaning, includes any structure used as overnight lodging for people, okay? Um, so again, now we are going to return to the issue and we are going to refine it. Right, we are going to refine it in light of the definition for building. So what is our issue here then? It's pretty simple. I think you have it. Oh, I'm sorry, Samrat, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I guess the legal issue here would be was with whether the cliff dwellings qualified as overnight lodging, like did they serve that function or not for persons? Exactly, exactly. Right? So um, do they qualify as buildings under the burglary statute when a building must be used for overnight lodging, right? Um, so if we are doing the IRAC, right? So you see how I, I left these slides on purpose on the left, you see that is our issue, right? So I'm giving you a pattern, remember our first slide, a pattern or a template to do, um, to do your legal analysis. So we've discovered our issue, right? We've discovered the facts that relate to a specific element that are in question. Then in an IRAC, we repeat the rule. So this is gonna be helpful when we get to Dr. Barty's um, section where, she's, where the, the courts are relying on a specific rule. That's the I, that's the R. Then with the application, right? We have to think to ourselves and discuss and write, right, and reason, we have to use our legal reasoning skills, why might cliff dwellings be structures and why might they not be structures used for the overnight lodging? Um, so I'd like to know, I'd like you just to take a second um, and think about wh why um, on one hand they could qualify as, an as a structure used for overnight lodging or why on the other hand they might not. Okay, great. Stands in. Uh, I have. I'll answer the next one, the second one. Why the cl uh, cliff dwellings might not be structures. Great. Right. Okay, because like uh, one of the reasons could be they are old, old ruins used by the ancient people. So can they be considered as like you know structures, like strong structures still standing? I mean, though yeah, it is still standing, but yeah, I don't know if they call it uh, the structures. So, so I'd like you to make an argument, Stanzen. Just hypothetically speaking, can you make an argument why they might not be structures? Uh, why? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, they can fall anytime. They are simply ruins. Okay, good. Anybody else want to? Uh, I have two more participants raising a hand. Let's see. Great, Abhay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so, as I mean, what I believe is that there should be a law which protects these uh, these uh, monuments. These are ancient monuments. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure even if they don't fall, even if they are uh, fit to stay overnight, the people will not be allowed because uh, they can disturb the monuments. So I'm pretty sure some law or rules would be there, which yeah, is the 
So yeah, I mean that would be, uh, I guess disallow people not to stay overnight. Mm -hmm. Um. Good. I want to hear from everybody, and then I have another comment from Sevki. Uh, I agree. They are old, but uh, they are uh, built in some time, and also they are used for the need of shelter. That's why I think they are structured, and uh, we can um, consider them as a uh, building in the uh, use of the sentence, I think. So you are saying they might be structured because they are used as, as shelter? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then um, some of the other students said they might not be structures because they're not currently used for the overnight lodging. I think that's what you were getting at when you were saying they might be protected, right? They might be, um, there would be a law against maybe going in there and spending the night, right? Um, Even if they are not, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Even if they are not used uh, now, but they can be used. So, right. Yeah, structures, I think. Okay, so um, Sevki, you're saying they could be used and they were used as overnight lodging. And the other students are saying, well, um, they can't be used now because it's against the law, right? So in effect, um, they're not actually um, being used for uh, overnight lodging. Does that make sense? Does anybody have something to, um, uh, t something to add? Uh, yeah, good. For the same reason, like I would say that, uh, you know, since they are old, ancient, that it might not be safe for people to stay there overnight, you know, since the buildings are building is not strong, the structure is not strong. So it might for safety reasons. So, yeah. 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 So I want to bring your attention to, right, the actual language of the um, of the definition, right, which is right. Um, any structure used for overnight lodging, right? And that's what we are analyzing. And I think you, we have good arguments on either side. Um, do we have more hands? Oh. Professor Yanisi, did you raise your hand? Yes. So it is important uh, to be overnight lodging that you spend your private life there. Mm -hmm. If it's a part of your private life, then it is according to Turkish law, it's a dwelling. But if you don't spend your private life there, it cannot be considered as. But as far as the elements of the crimes are concerned, uh, there's a definition or the division of crimes for mens rea and actus reus to part. But in Turkey, we divide them in four elements. So there's a difference between the, diff the division of the elements of the crime in Turkey. I see. That's what Sevgi was saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, and Bahadir, did you have something to add? Yes, I want to add that I think the term structure is defined somehow different in nowadays. I think it involves human powers involving. What I mean is, for example, if we think a house, there's a human power contribution. But if you think a cliff dwelling, it's, it is shaped by the nature development. I just want to add that. Yes, thank you. That's very important. I appreciate um, what you're sharing, uh, Dr. Uh, Yanisi, from your jurisdiction and the, the, you know, the difference in looking at elements. And I appreciate what you're saying um, also about um, that the overnight lodging, right, needs to include um, humans, right? It needs to, there needs to be a human element to it. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that's what I mean. So. Yeah, very good. Um, so this is your, so what you just went through, that's your application. Those are the arguments, right? That you are, um, that the arguments about whether this element is or is not satisfied. So when you do your legal analysis, right? Um, you have the elements and then you tell the reader what element is at issue, right? That's your issue statement. You remind the reader of the rule. 
And then you tell the reader for the element that is at issue, what are the arguments for you know, the, the possible arguments that it is a structure, right? And the possible arguments that it is not a structure. Um, and so based on what we've discussed today, I'd like to know what do you, what would your conclusion be based on what we've discussed? In, and I think everybody had a, had a very good point. What would your conclusion be? Are the cliff dwellings a structure or not? And therefore, was burglary in the third degree committed or not? You can take a chance. Uh, Bahadir and Sevki. Well, first, we'll hear from Bah Bahadir and then Sevki. Should I, should I start, start first? I'm sorry, I missed it. No, you you ran first, I did. Okay. I, as a conclusion, I will say it, uh, stealing a letter from the cliff dwelling does not constitute a burglary because there is not a uh, there is not a human involving the in the terms of the structure. Mm -hmm. I would say that. Yes. So, and then if we um, went back to the um, actual, um, if we went back to the actual language, right, defining building, um, it said overnight lodging, right? So I think what you're saying. So we always go back, and so I understand what Dr. Yanisi and you are saying, and that's um, very much mirrors, right, the language of this rule. And so we always go back to the language of the rule that we are using, right? And so um, we would go back to the language of, of this particular rule, no overnight lodging. It's not used, in fact, for overnight lodging because it can't be currently used, right? So um, that was very good how you gave a specific conclusion with a reason, right? So you can very clearly spell out all those parts of the legal analysis. I think um, there was another comment. Was that Sevki? I was actually saying the same thing because uh, it is not currently used, and that's why we cannot say it's a burglary. But it would be used uh, if the structure itself it can be used still. So I think in that case, in that time. It is not a burglary, but it could be if the, um, if the situation was different at that time. So, Savki, you are saying that they would not be used. You, you think they would, it, although they could be, they are not used. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, do you think burglary was committed then or not? Um, not. No. Okay. 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 So, it seems like we reached the same conclusion. Um, so this was just kind of a simple example to show you that we list all those components in that order, right, as a, as a pattern, right, whether we're examining legal analysis in this decision or whether we're performing legal analysis when a, a person comes in, right, to ask us a question or when we um, are uh, researching legal analysis, right, or even when we're, when we're doing an exam. Um, so although no one said, uh, I didn't see any hands when you, um, I asked for uh, if anyone was familiar with IRAC, R-I-A-C, it seems that this was very easy for you. <laughs> so I think in some ways you were familiar with it, right? Um, knowing the components and, um, and, the, and the different formats. Um, are there any questions before we go to Dr. Um, oh, fair enough, Dr. Yenesey. Well, the <clears throat> description IREC may be confusing to, for our students. Okay. But IREC is known in Turkey since the 1940s. Okay. So my professor Suhi Dermezer, who visited United States 1940 as a scholar, and he brought this concept to our uh, practicing uh, classes. And he analyzes all cases under this um, order, but he doesn't name, of course, IREC, but the structure is the same. So we issue, we first take the issue, what is the issue, what is the rule, what's the application, what's the conclusion, but we don't name it IREC. So therefore, 
<laughs> there was some conclusion with our students, I think. Okay, thank you very much for explaining that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Are there any more questions or comments before we go to Dr. Barty to practice Iraq again in another context? Or legal analysis, I will call it. We will call it legal analysis. <laughs> It seems so. Uh, we don't have any further questions to hear, but there are some uh, responses in the chat. Uh, so we'll try to take it. We're just going through the written uh, response. Okay, so um, let's see. I see that um, Tuxi has a question um, from the, uh, the PDF, which was um, just an outline, right, of the IRAC uh, method using negligence. Um, in a negligence case in which the defendant argues that the plaintiff assumed the risk of harm, the relevant rule of law could be the elements of negligence and the definition of assumption of risk as a defense. Don't just simply list the cause of action, such as negligence, as a rule of law. What rule must the court apply to the facts to determine the outcome? Okay, so you're saying, um, Tuxi, that you're not understanding what this means. Um, the directions there um, mean simply that when you cite the rule, when you're doing issue, rule, application, conclusion, when you're referring to the rule, that the reader, um, or you know the court, and you'll you'll notice this in court decisions um, doesn't need needs more than just the name of the rule. They would you would need to say the full rule that negligence, right? Um, at least for example in the U.S. would be duty, breach of duty, causation, right, and damages. Um, then you would also need to in this case um, explain the so basically explaining the elements. Right, so instead of just saying the name of the rule negligence, um, the directions are saying lay out all the elements. That's true for assumption of risk as well. Instead of just saying the name of the rule assumption of risk, we would lay out all the elements, right? A person voluntarily um, engages in, a, in a, a reckless activity, you know, would be an example of the elements, right? Um, I hope that makes sense. Is there a follow-up question? Okay, good. Okay, thank you, Tuxi. Uh, so let's uh, proceed with our discussion. Uh, with this basic understanding about the IREC skill of understanding how the problem can be solved in a systematic manner and how the different components can be uh, identified first and then uh, taken care of uh, in stages. Uh, now I would like to discuss with you uh, another exemplary case, uh, which deals with negligence, coincidentally, I mean, like could say this question relates to negligence case, case, on, uh, case uh, which has law of negligence being applied to come to a conclusion. And my illustration also relates with negligence. So I am, I believe that it's going to uh, further your understanding uh, through the illustration, which is coming in my discussion. Uh, Bahadir has raised his hand, so they would like to take his question before we proceed ahead. What if there is a one more than question? How can we classify the IREC? There is only one. We, we wrote up to now just one issue. What about there is one more than issue? How can we? Should we imply for each question different IREC or should we put all the issues in a row all together and answer it? That's a very good question. May I answer that question? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and that comes up, especially in uh, any kind of legal problem where there's lots, lots of issues, right? How do we organize it, right? So my suggestion would be um, based on the, the, the pedagogy of the United States, right? Based on my experience that you do a separate IRAC, right? Separate IRAC each time. So for example, um, in our problem with the cliff dwellings, um, 
what if there was um, a question, right? That, that, that maybe there were two issues. There was a question about whether the cliff dwellings were buildings, and there was a cliff, cliff uh, a question about whether um, Margaret the tourist really had intent, right? Maybe she said she wanted a, a ladder, but did she really have intent? Um, I would do a separate IRAC, separate one separate analysis for um, whether it was a building, and then one separate anal a separate analysis for. Um, whether or not she really had intent. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. And just to add to the explanation of Professor Margaret, I would like to discuss the Indian uh, context on application of IRAC. Uh, in India, uh, though uh, the, the approach is similar, but uh, the structure for writing is, is quietly different. So I would like to showcase, uh, Anand will take up your uh, question also. Uh, so in India, we write down all the issues one after another. So, we'll, mm -hmm. so we uh, go ahead with the component. It's like all the facts in points, then comes uh, rules, then all the rules which are applicable mm -hmm. to the given fact, and then analysis, and then the conclusion. Though uh, each issue needs to be responded, but they are not dealt with segregately. It's like, okay, one heading and everything which comes under it. Yeah, Vishal, I would like to take up your question. What's your question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is, if we do a separate IREC for every separate legal problem, but will there be any point when all the separate uh, analysis will be clubbed together? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so answer to your questions, I would like to showcase you a simple IREC answer. I think that will answer all the questions which are coming up, be it Bahadir's question or Vishal's or uh, any other person who just wrote in the chat box. So the given uh, illustration is on uh, a case in which uh, law of negligence in particular and generally the law of uh, torts was applicable. Uh, so it's a case of Kasturi Lal, which uh, most of the Indian students must have heard of. Uh, it's a case uh, on sovereign immunity I would like to share my screen to showcase you a simple answer of application of IREC. And see, IREC can be used for two purposes. One is, one purpose is what uh, is just being discussed by Professor Margaret. That is, okay, you have a problem, you apply IREC, and then you come to a conclusion. In, the, uh, in this approach also, there is one component that is rule. And to understand rule, you need to refer either the statute books or the judicial pronouncement as per the Indian laws. Because in India, the source of law consists of statutory rules, law, or uh, the judicial pronouncement, because in India, precedent is the source of law, means the earlier judgment on a similar fact is being followed and looked into by uh, the judiciary in subsequent cases and the customary law. So to uh, find out the content for the rule, uh, we can refer to the judicial pronouncement and how a judgment can be read, be better understood by applying the IREC method. So it's a reverse order. So here you have a judgment. So in the Margaret's illustration, it was like you have facts, then you understand what exactly is the issue which the parties are suggesting and uh, what is the relevant law to deal with that issue and what could be the conclusion to suggest or to think of or to, uh, to request and plead before the court of law. Other approach of using IREC method is that you wish to understand that what exactly is the position of law. And for that purpose, you, you can refer to judgment as per the Indian uh, legal system and jurisprudence and from there, you uh, from the judgment, you segregate these components, issue, rule, analysis, and judgment. That what exactly is the judgment? And before I showcase you by sharing the my screen, uh, I would also like to bring to your attention another component, which you'll get to see in that PPT. Uh, it is for international students and just to give them some background understanding uh, of how, uh, uh, judicial pronouncements uh, uh, act as a source of law and what are the components which can be seen in a judicial pronouncement. Uh, in India, a judgment can be pronounced by a single judge. At the same time, it can also be pronounced by 
a bench of judges means there could be more than one judge uh, in a they can just hold there is something Uh, yeah, I hope you people can see my screen. There was some uh, technical issue which we were trying to resolve. Uh, so, uh, in the judgment from Indian uh, Indian courts, uh, you get to see uh, Alisha. We will take up your question. Uh, Ali, uh, yeah. So we would like. Sorry, to it was it was a wrong. Uh... Henry's. And I just wanted to say that the thumb, uh, everything is okay now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm just trying to brief the international students that in the Indian uh, judgments, we can get to see the majority opinion, which constitutes a conclusion and which forms a precedent for the subsequent cases. And it can also have a descending opinion. So a judgment which has single judge, there we find one conclusion, whereas in a judgment which has a bench of judges, means more than one judges, still there will be one conclusion on the basis of majority opinion, but still the judgment uh, acknowledges the descending opinion. So in the illustration, I uh, will exhibit the descending opinion of uh, the judgment, uh, which I'm going to illustrate to see that how rule can be understood by the application of IREC method. So IREC method can be used not only for problem solving when a client approaches you uh, and for suggesting that what could be the probable outcome uh, for uh, of the issues which he is uh, addressing and sharing with you for understanding the legal recourse which is available to him. But uh, from the point of view of an advocate attorney, when they do their research, uh, uh, for preparing their brief to be presented before the court of law. To understand rule, IREC method can also be applied. So I, as uh, my screen is visible to you, uh, I wish to show you that, see, this is the name of the case, Kasturi uh, Lal Raria Ram uh, Jain versus State of Uttar Pradesh. You see the citation and everything. Uh, and then comes the fact of the case. Uh, so the fact of the case was, uh, here, this appellant was a partner in a law, uh, was a partner in a firm which used to deal uh, with jewelry. And this person came to a certain part of India uh, to to sell uh, some gold and uh, silver which he was carrying. But because he was uh, uh, a merchant, he was a businessman dealing with uh, selling of gold and jewelry, and the police uh, officers of that particular region suspected him to have stolen uh, that uh, jewelry and they confiscated, means they took away the jewelry from him and they kept in the custody of the police station. And he was arrested and he was detained. He moved, in, uh, he moved forward his application for bail by producing evidences that he is in the lawful custody of the jewelry. And when it was found that he is the owner of the jewelry and that custody is lawful, he was released on bail. When he was released on bail, he asked for the recovery of uh, the jewelry, which was uh, taken from his custody and kept in the police custody. But then it was found 
the jewelry was missing from the police custody. A person who was in charge of that custody in the police station ran away with the jewelry. The police force, uh, the department tried finding that person, but that person fled to other country. And it was found that it is beyond the control to bring that person back. So these were the facts of the case, that there is a person who is a dealer, businessman of jewelry. He was suspected of, uh, of uh, being in unlawful possession of jewelry. Jewelry uh, got confiscated from him, kept in the police custody. He was also kept in police custody. By producing the relevant document, he got released and he could prove that he was in the lawful custody of the jewelry. When he asked for the recovery of jewelry that could not be returned because the person who was in custody ran away with the jewelry and he ran away to other jurisdiction to other country and the government could not bring him back. But the appellant had had an issue. So now till now you could see the facts of the case. So this is how the IREC method is applied in India for uh, understanding uh, uh, the different components of judgment and to understand what exactly is the rule. And it is also essential to understand the facts because only on the similar facts, the same rule can be applied as a source of law. So when we read a judgment, it's not only that what exactly is the conclusion or rule laid down in that particular judgment, which is relevant, but also the facts, because only when the facts before the case are similar with the facts of a judgment, which are being referred as a source of no, it becomes relevant and a given ruling in a judgment can be applied as a source of law for problem solving before the court of law. So for these two reasons, uh, IREC method in understanding the judgment becomes uh, relevant in Indian context. So on your screen, you get to see the facts and then comes the issue. What exactly <coughs> is the issue? Uh, this person filed a case and uh, he says there was negligence in keeping the jewelry, which was confiscated from him and kept in the police custody. So there was negligence in the control and custody of the police officer. And second, because there was negligence uh, on the part of the police officer, he is entitled for compensation. So his claim was either you return the jewelry or if you can't return the jewelry because the person has fled to some other country, give him the compensation, which is equivalent to the value of the jewelry. And then third issue which comes is in India, there is a law which says sovereign, which talks about and which provides sovereign immunity. Means if uh, an act which happens to be a negligent act uh, happened during the discharge of sovereign, a discharge of function, then the state cannot be held liable. So the third issue was whether a, a police officer who was discharging his sovereign duty of uh, keeping the custody of things which were suspected to be stolen can be held liable to pay compensation or whether the state can be held liable for paying compensation to appellant uh, for the negligent act of its public servant. So these were the three issues. So this is what I was uh, uh, responding to uh, in response to one of the questions which was raised that how in the Indian practice, issues are being written. So it's like all the facts in sequence in the chronological order are listed. And out of those facts, what are the issues which were litigated, argued before the court? Because in India, we have adversarial system. On each issue, both the party produce their evidences. So once the issue means the point of dispute between the parties clear, then comes the new uh, and then comes the next stage that is of the rule. The rule here, uh, which is applicable to the given uh, facts uh, of the case is of uh, sovereign immunity. State is immune for any liability which can be incurred in the discharge of sovereign obligation and policing, maintaining law and order, keeping the custody of things confiscated from suspect Falls under the uh, falls under the discharge of sovereign duty. So, as per the law, 
As for the analysis and application of law, the state cannot be held liable. So the conclusion and the ruling of the court was that yes, there could be some negligence, but the person who is charged for this act of negligence was a public servant and he was discharging his public duty. So by the application of this, this rule, which gives sovereign immunity, the person, the accused cannot be held liable. This was the ruling of this given judgment and it was based on the majority of the opinion. If you had noticed on the uh, initial page that this case was listed before bench of judges. So there were more than one judges to deal with this issue. Uh, there were six judges who applied their judicial mind to see uh, what could be the conclusion and what could be verdict and what could be the response of issue before the court. Majority of the opinion means out of six, five of the judges lay down this ruling that there is an established rule which says sovereign immunity, so no liability, and the appellant has no remedy in it. Whereas one judge, that is Justice Gajendra Gadkar, he was the opinion that we borrowed this piece of law that is of sovereign immunity from common law. And with the passage of time, with change in uh, 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 social setup and other things, uh, uh, in that country, uh, the law of sovereign immunity has been changed to an extent. But we uh, who borrowed it from the common law are still following it. So we need to rethink uh, about the suitability of this law in the Indian context also. But at this point, he was uh, in minority, means his opinion was in minority. So the point which we need to understand here is any opinion which is in minority and which could not get support of majority of the opinion is an opinion which is a different opinion, but that does not mean that is a wrong opinion. So never ever restrict your analysis, your opinion uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a direction which uh, uh, gets support from the majority or which you generally see being, see being applied and followed in majority of the decision. In law, law reforms take place when anybody points out such inadequacy in the existing law. So being an advocate, you can play a role of representing the interest of people in Indian context. At the same time, you can also play an important role of bringing reforms in the law by bringing to the notice the inadequacies in the current uh, and existing laws. So in India, uh, courts are empowered. Uh, the Supreme Court, that is Supreme Court, uh, the Apex Court is empowered to uh, overrule its uh, judgment, to amend the law, to make uh, developments in the law because judicial pronouncements are the source of law. And when the Apex Court, that is Supreme Court, amend the laws, it brings it new, refined, revised, more updated law. And we need to, we as a lawyer need to understand that law needs to correspond to the needs and expectation of people. If we want people to express their loyalty, abidance, uh, respect for the law, it should, it should correspond to their needs. If with the growth and development and change in the expectation and maturity of uh, thinking of the people, the expectation changes and if the law falls short of, uh, then the cases of disobedience and disloyalty increases. And that's why in India, we have this system of updating and revising our laws uh, as and when the need arises. And that need can be highlighted by the practicing advocate, by highlighting certain lacunas in, in the existing law, by highlighting that though to some time, for a period of time, that law uh, could, could, could uh, stand up to the expectations or needs of people. But now there's change in the needs of the people because of growth and development in the society or because of change in the nature and maturity of the society and we need to bring in the change. So that is also one of the important role which you people uh, can play while practicing law. So on your screen, you see a descending opinion. And I wish to show you very, very interesting the uh, 
development which took place afterwards uh, 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 judge uh, gajendra garkar very strongly uh, laid down his dissenting opinion he was not influenced by the majority of opinions he strongly penned down his opinion that though this is the law in india and which is settling the current issue which we had in our hand but the time has come that we should rethink of its relevancy and its adequacy and we should consider updating it to make in certain cases even the state liable to pay compensation when they are negligent in their conduct which uh, which led to some of the uh, then came some of the developments by way of law commission uh reports in india law commission does some researches and suggest suggestions in the existing law a bill was also uh, produced before the parliament uh for uh, improvement in the law uh though and in the subsequent cases we see though uh, the kasturi lal judgment has not yet been expressly overruled but we see glimpses of uh, differential treatment in some of the judgment where the state has been asked to pay compensation uh, for the decision or action so i hope with this illustration you could uh, get to see a sample of writing an iraq method that how you write facts in a chronological order how you list all the issues each issue needs to be responded in your analysis and finally in the conclusion part the concluding uh, conclusion answers to all the issues and if you are reading a judgment that conclusion becomes the rule which can be followed in subsequent cases in the similar facts so that is another approach or way of using iraq method and now i would like uh, uh, we, we we would be uh, splitting you in groups uh, we shared a small judgment yesterday uh, i wish i i suggest that you people refer to smith judgment i request that you people to refer to smith judgment and make a simple answer the way i showed you on your screen that call out take out the facts out of that small judgment it's a very small judgment of three pages and we shared it in advance also uh, so you must have a, you must have uh, uh, skimmed through it must have tried reading it if not word by word some aspect of it and still we are giving you uh let's say minutes uh we we will be dividing you into groups and then we'll give you 10 minutes of time and uh one person can be nominated for presenting uh the group activity uh, outcome and in case any group wants that instead of one person uh, presenting the whole group exercise uh, you may identify that okay in a group of four there are four component all the four students uh, narrate and present one one component so choice is yours that there could be one representative of group or you may divide the component among mm -hmm. yourself and then students may choose the components and then make presentation mm -hmm. me, me uh, i'll take up your question uh i and uh, professor margaret will be uh, coming to each of the group to facilitate uh, the given exercise in case you have any doubt we'll uh, reach out to you but before we break uh, break out the, the uh, you people in smaller groups i see one hand raised uh, so we would like to take up that uh yeah we have two hands one is uh rutuja and another is of professor ganesh so uh rutuja you may go ahead and then we would like to uh, part our ways for uh, group breakouts with uh, professor ganesh's uh, response to to the discussion and the exercise yes uh, ma'am uh, i had a question uh, that uh, if there are if i am citing some case law and uh, uh, the the two uh, case laws can be factually different but uh, the essence can be similar which i want to cite uh, before a judge can i use that if two cases are factually or uh, not similar see uh, rituja i pres presume that you are from india so you understand the law of precedent yeah uh, the law of a higher court is binding on a case pending before the lower court and uh, that law can be applied only when the facts are similar because okay. the, the principle is like okay if 
earlier the similar facts were settled in one particular way then in a subsequent cases similar facts means the party placed in similar situation should be treated in a similar way but if the facts are different people are placed differently so it's a, it, it it cannot be guided by the uh, judgment coming from different facts okay uh, professor yanese we would like to take your inputs on it uh, thank you so uh, the ruling of a judge in turkey also is related to the iraq so in every judge's decision or court decision we see this division there's a issue and there's a rule and application of the rule and conclusion but the analysis is reasoning in turkey so there must be a reasoning in every judge's decision and this is a requirement by the constitution so the constitution rules that every judge's or court decision must be furnished with reasoning and if there is no reasoning it's it's not valid decision so therefore uh, your comments about iraq is also important for us as reasoning but although this is the case uh, many uh, judges decisions in turkey are not furnished with adequate reasoning so therefore we are making a big uh, work a survey on this problem now how to uh, make it run the work the reasoning and what is reasoning reasoning is a combination of the issue and the ruling and you have to explain to the community the legal community and the whole world that you are justified in doing this and teach something while reasoning giving a reason but in the, there are two kinds of uh, decisions in criminal procedure one is the final judgments but the other is the decisions of the judge about the running of the case for example if the case the judge is ruling on pretrial detention or confiscation like in your case or seizing something it's the judge's ruling and if there's a error in this ruling uh, without reasoning etc it's not a valid decision in the case of preliminary investigation if something is confiscated or seized and there's a wrong in that like in your case we have a legal remedy against this in turkey the accused person can bring a sue a case against illegally handing of the legal remedies in uh, uh, of the state and the state must compensate uh, if there's a legal error in the application of the law in preliminary investigation phase so in your case if the gold is missing so the state has the obligation of the the paying back the person under this legal remedy so during the case is running you may ask the court to give a legal remedy and you get your compensation from the state so we have a differentiation between the uh, sovereign immunity of the police officers we don't have this concept in turkey the police are not immune but there's another problem in turkey with the immunity of the police officers if the police are acting in prevention powers not in judicial powers but prevention powers they need to have a authorization from the state to be sued but if the police are acting within a criminal investigation there is no authorization required so we have a similar position for police officers in turkey but not not a immunity in your sense this is very different in legal approach i think okay thank but you before i conclude i would like to introduce you aslihan she is a lawyer 
with whom we are working together with this family violence issues. And I invited to her to join us. I talked to her about our yesterday's conversation. And we are going to continue with you, Margaret, about this uh, pro project. I'm looking forward to that. And she's therefore here for today. Yes, I got your email and um, I will follow up with you. Okay, okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for having me in this class, actually. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice to meet you, Aslihan. Uh, so with this input from uh, Professor Yanisli, which I believe has made a bridge of understanding be uh, between the position of law between uh, India, US, and Turkey. And with this uh, uh, inputs uh, about the law and position and the way IREC method is being used at different stages, be it the problem solving or identification of the rule, we would like to break the students into different groups and i suggest that the reading which i shared with uh, like which has been shared with you people that is on smith case uh, only the smith case you uh, just read it and make a simple iraq exercise make a simple answer based on the iraq method from the judgment you need to identify what are the facts? Write down one, two, three, four in points. Next, what are the issues? Write down the issues. Next, what is the rule which is being applied to answer those uh, 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 answer those issues and the reasoning? And then comes the, uh, in rule, you just write rule. And in the conclusion, uh, you write what exactly is the final outcome, output of a court and what reasons have been given. So we are just sending you to different groups.
Uh, Hassan, we see on screen one new person who just joined. Do you wish us to assign uh, him to any group or is he or she a professor who joined? She's our assistant student. Uh, she graduated from our law school, Gilendam. Welcome. Uh, so I, we I think... send her to any group or do we? Do you wish to go to any of the groups or? Well, uh, I'm sorry I attended, probably attended late. I uh, forgot to enroll to the course because I knew it was going to happen. So I didn't think that it was necessary for me to enroll. So I forgot to join the first session uh, and I'm currently working right now, but I will be listening to the courses. So if there is anything I can do, like if there are groups that are working together right now, I can just join one of them. That's absolutely fine. Uh, that's absolutely fine. And I 
I, I think that if you join in, in some of the groups, you will follow something, at least when they come up with the presentations. So uh, if you have not read, uh, the, do you have the judgment which was shared? Do you have the text? Uh, no, I, I don't have... think so. Sorry, no, I don't... No, no worries. So, uh, uh, Hassan, can you share it with her so that in the breakout room when she goes, she has her handout? And I am putting you in one of the groups and you can refer to your handout and then you can just follow what is happening. And uh, as you just joined, so it's fine if you okay. learn in this breakout. Yulanda is our uh, assistant at the past activities. Wow. So she is the leading person in the past activities for March and the other sessions. So. Good to know you. So uh, we honor your uh, choice of going to any of the groups. And I believe that Hassan must have because he's so good in, uh, in, in technological aspect. I struggle. <laughs> uh, so I am sharing you in one of the groups, which has lesser number of people. Thank All you and for being raised. Thank you again.
Uh, so uh, we see all the students back to the main class and now we would like to hear from you that what uh, you could discuss and uh, we would like to take the lead. Yesterday we started from group one, today we would like to start from group three. So group three, would you like to showcase your uh, simple answer? Uh, yes, ma'am. So, according to the question given through IRAC process, the issue in the case of uh, Smith versus Huggies was that uh, the legal issue was the section one, sub clause one, come under the street offenses as uh, the two prostitutes were uh, uh, soliciting from inside their houses and not on the streets. And uh, the and there are four scenarios in which. Uh, the prostitutes were uh, uh, soliciting uh, at the first floor by banging the door of their houses and hissing and and uh, the uh, and the rule here applied is the same uh, and the interpretation part uh, was like though they were not on the streets the it would uh, the offense would come under the street offenses act and uh, uh, the con and uh, we can see that the ju the judges have uh, have come under the similar conclusion for each of the scenario. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, right. Uh, anything else to add on by any of the group members of group three? Ma'am, while uh, ma'am. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, while making the interpretation for this particular clause that is regarding the Street Offenses Act Clause 1, the judges have taken into consideration the intent of that particular act too. Uh, that is the mischief that was aimed at. Though the, um, was, uh, though the um, uh, clause is framed in such a way that it talks about the street, it, uh, the intent of the act was to prevent solicitation from happening and uh, since the act uh, that these women committed, uh, though that has taken place from places that are next to the street or in, on the balconies of the houses that is re residing next to the street, taking into consideration the uh, effect of the act, uh, the interpretation has been made that this uh, particular, uh, I mean, the balcony that is so talked about is also a part of the street and hence the act should apply uh, in this particular fact situation. Yeah, it adds to the reasoning. Uh, good point, Helen. Uh, group two, who would like to present? Uh, yes, on behalf of group two, I would uh, like to present. Uh, should I continue all over again or like say any like important few things? So if there is anything add on to, or if there yeah. is a point uh, at which you differ, yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, the facts and the issue, like, yeah, the issue main, the area, uh, the main issue was, like, whether all this, because they were, they spoke of different cases here with similar facts. So, whether in all these cases, like, uh, in each case, uh, the main issue was, like, all these women, uh, whether it can be said that they were solicited, soliciting in a street or public place, uh, you know, as per the section one, uh, subclause, uh, subsection one of this Street Offenses Act. So the reason, I think I'll just come to the re uh, reason, uh, the application and the ratio given by the court. Uh, the court, as uh, earlier said, like the court looked at here the, at the intent of the act. What was the real purpose of the act? So without uh, considering whether uh, whether this women were physically present in a street or not on the or the road or the uh, street or not, so they looked at the intent of the act and said that the intent of the act was to keep the streets clean, uh, so so as to prevent molestation by the prostitutes uh, to the, all these men. So so the court was the they came they came to the conclusion that whether these women they openly invited men or signaled to them from the balcony or have closed uh, windows it doesn't matter 
we should look at the intent of the act so they then they were of the opinion that yes this women are like uh, guilty uh, for uh, this thing what do you call obstructing uh, for infringing the uh, streets offenses act yeah yeah uh, good observation and i really appreciate uh, how our groups are, are are giving adequate attention to the reasoning part and i think the credit goes for it to professor yenese who so uh, nicely explained the relevance of reasoning for any uh, any judgment. So uh, the group members are not only identifying that what exactly is the issue uh, between the parties and what could be the relevant law stated in the judgment, uh, but while mentioning the conclusion, the verdict, the ruling, they are also emphasizing uh, the reasoning which could uh, substantiate the verdict. So I really appreciate this thing that you not only understood the component of IREC, but you also understood that how the reasoning given for the conclusion can add uh, uh, to the uh, to the to the reasonableness of the verdict. Michelle, yes, what's your input? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have an add-on to the uh, every, uh, to the every discussion, and that is that, of course, in the second part of the judgment, in the initial phases only, the judge has clarified the everything. But I think is that if we had a different set of judges, then the judgment might have been different because here they are interpreting uh, their interpretation is on the basis of intent and they have used the term specifically the act was aimed. It mattered not where the prostitute standard. So I think it also uh, the judgment might be different with a different set of judges or might be something else or might be the same. But interpretation is quite tricky here. So, thank you. Uh, I, I, I agree with you, Vishal, that it may have happened that if there is a bench of judges, the way we had bench of judges means more than one judges deciding any particular uh, set of issues in a case, then uh, a couple of judges giving one uh, one one opinion and uh, there could be uh, one or two uh, judges giving a descending or different opinion. So maybe if these facts were kept before a, a bench of judges, uh, there we could have found difference of opinion. But uh, the, the, uh, on the basis of the law, which is cited in the judgment and the reasoning which could we think of, the most probable outcome, most probable reasonable outcome seems to be the, this one. But I, I agree with your point, which, which, which uh, uh, reflects the relevance of descending opinion uh, which we get to see in the illustration we discussed uh, so group one uh hi um, i will not say much different things from the other other groups but uh issue is the does prostitute sections can be considered in the street or not this is the exact issue the and the rule is the street offenses act section one one uh, on application, the judges said we should look at the intent of the law, not the direct meaning. And uh, they reached the conclusion that the, it's a violation of State Offense Act 1-1. But there's something I'd like to add uh, at this point. And uh, who is my client? Oh, I, I don't know. There's a clear argument here. And my answer will depend on my client because I have to uh, defend their be, they, their best, uh, I don't know, interests, and I can't say it, this is the answer exactly. Yeah, I, I, I understand your point, as in which you are trying to say that if you apply IREG on the given fact from the approach which Professor Margaret dis, uh, discussed, you might have come to a different, you might have tried at least to come to a different conclusion, which supports the claim of your client. So if you happen to be uh, the advocate of the defendants, uh, of, of, of the prosecutrix who have been prosecuted, so you may you may have tried to given a uh, different reasoning uh, to uh, to support the claim and defense of plea of your client, but if you apply the IREC method for the purpose of understanding what exactly is the rule, what exactly is the rule, then this could be one of the approaches which have be, which could have been applied. But I understand your point that we because we started our discussion with two approaches of applying IREC. And you have identified very good point 
that first of all we need to see which approach are we adopting to uh, serve uh, while identifying <coughs> or applying the IREC method. I appreciate your point. Okay, so all, you. all of you are right. I just want to share a screen uh, so you just get to see. So it's like issue, it's written. Uh, the first defendant was a prostitute soliciting men from the balcony. The second uh, defendant used winter to solicit men. The issue in this case was whether the defendant had violated uh, section one of the Street Offenders Act. So this is uh, Seviki uh, uh, will take your question. I'm just giving you illustrative, illustrative sample of the exercise which you all tried uh, uh, attempting it and the rule could be uh, I, I request you people keep your hand raised so that once we are done I could come back to you. Rule uh, view all uh, identified appropriately that's the uh, section one of the street of analysis you all uh, did it correctly that okay is the intent of the act which need to be looked into while uh, while analyzing whether the facts and issue come within the scope of identified rule, which people identified it right, and the conclusion, if our approach and the purpose of application of law is to understand the rule, would be this, that the mode of solicitation, the case was projected upon the passerby and the prostitute were held liable. So this is a, a, a draft of answer which people can write. Um, you it can slightly vary with your approaches uh, the way as you mentioned and now i would like to take a uh, sevgi uh point and then we would like to take inputs from professor genesee uh we were group four but we didn't present I sorry, was... sorry. <laughs> is it <laughs> we have time we would like to listen from you i'm so sorry okay then summer can you can start yeah sure hi uh so uh we'll start with the facts uh, two common prostitutes solicited men. Uh, they stood on a balcony uh, and uh, hid behind window panes and tapped on the railing and tapped on with metal objects on the window pane to try and draw their attention. Uh, they used uh, their hands to show like information as to their price for the services that they offered. Um, so those are the facts. Now we move to the legal issue. The legal issue at this play would be whether the act of drawing attention by tapping on the rail or the window pane qualifies the criteria of soliciting or loitering in a public place according to the ninth section one one of the 1959 act now will run you through the legal elements of the rule and the legal elements is that uh, it shall be an offense for a common prostitute to loiter or solicit in a street or public place for the purpose of prostitution this is the section one of the street offenses act and uh, a common prostitute uh, can be uh, applied in that point because uh, there is a, a common prostitute. Uh, so this is a check. Then to loiter or solicit, she does not loiter in the street or the public place, but solicits in the public place. And the third one is that uh, for the purpose for prostitution, this is uh, uh, applied to because uh, there is a purpose of prostitution. And uh, it is in a street or a public place. Uh, the balcony is not in the street, but the soliciting happens in the street. So uh, in the application part, the court uh, focuses on the intent. Uh, so as a conclusion, there is a violation. OK, good. So, uh, with respect to conclusion, ma'am, I think it has already been presented. So I don't want to add it and take time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for your inputs and for your engagement. It, and it gives us pleasure uh, and satisfaction that, okay, we could convey uh, you uh, uh, the knowledge which we wanted to convey. And uh, from your responses, we could see that uh, how comfortable you have uh, become uh, in applying this skill. Now, we would like to take inputs from Professor Genesee. Professor Genesee. Well, in order to reach the verdict, the members of the court have to must have to uh, in camera meeting. In this in this camera meeting, they ask themselves three questions. The first question is, did the accused commit the conduct? So the, the conduct in this case is soliciting men from the balcony. So if the conduct is proven by the uh, evidence. So this is the material element of the crime 
must be proven by the elements? The answer is yes. So the accused has committed the conduct. Yes. If yes, the court members go to the second question. Does the committed crime, a uh, committed conduct, constitute a crime? So this is the legal element of the issue. And then they check the material elements of the crime and compare it with the conduct. If it's, they fit all together, then they say, yes, the, the conduct co constitutes a crime. So this is the second stage. Then they go to the third stage and ask themselves, does the accused has criminal responsibility? Is he mentally ill or is he minor, etc.? If he has criminal responsibility, they say he is guilty. So this, this is the first stage of this decision making for our judges. They ask three questions and if there's one no, there's an acquittal. But if there is yes, yes, they go forward. And after they establish he is guilty or she is guilty, then they start to make the uh, fixing the uh, decision of the punishment. It can be a punishment or a measurement, etc. But they fix the measurement or punishment after they fix the guilt. But in order to go forward, they have to vote. In each problem, the first question, did he commit the conduct? They vote amongst themselves. And there should be a majority of uh, the uh, uh, votes in yes. But if there's one no, this, this one has to go forward with the second question. Although he says he didn't commit, if the majority says he did commit, he has to participate to the second question. So this is a problem in Turkish Turkey they, under discussion. If the first one of the judges says no, he is not, he did not commit the crime. Does he have to participate to the second stage? The second stage is is it a crime or not? But if he says he didn't, he, many lawyers think. He shouldn't participate in the second question. But a decision is a whole itself. Therefore, we argue that even if he did not say the first no, he has to take part in the second, and he has to give a descending opinion at the end of the uh, ruling that he didn't participate in, but still he has to go forward with the all uh, voting. So this is the mode how it goes in Turkey. Yeah, very interesting uh, input, Professor Yenisi. And when you were presenting, I was just thinking of corresponding uh, uh, approaches which is being uh, adopted, uh, which is being applied. Uh, as we are running out of time, only one point I wish to make that we do have the same steps to deal with the case. And we don't experience the issue, which you just mentioned that uh, Turkey uh, uh, courts experience because in the lower courts where uh, the case is being presented, they are basically uh, litigating a question of fact. And when there is a question of fact to be discussed, there is always one judge. Whereas when the case goes in appeal, there the focus is more on question of law. That is your second stage. And on the, uh, on the question of law, the way I exhibited one of the judgments, there can be difference in opinion on the question of law and how it should be applied and the majority wins. This is how we deal with it. And we would like to take input from Professor Margaret on this or, or further the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I appreciate how um, I wanna just return to this, giving feedback to the students. I thought it was great to hear the students talk about their analysis in terms of um, the elements right, and in terms of the structure of, um, of, of Iraq. So I really appreciate that. And um, I also really appreciate learning about Turkish law 
uh, right from my initial um, presentation, learning about your definition of burglary and also how you do the elements differently, the actus reus and the mens rea. Um, so this is a very um, wonderful experience for me to be exposed um, and to learn from the Turkish students and from yourself. Um, in, in terms of the process, um, so uh, as you know, um, uh, America was also colonized by the British, <laughs> although start, so, or start or, or imported the British rule, not, maybe not colonized, but, um, and so we have that same, those same steps that um, Professor Barty mentioned of um, the lower court, the trial being the facts. So that would be deciding whether or not um, in, in the case of the prostitutes, um, they really did, they really, you know, made the action of soliciting, right? Um, and um, and then let's say they got convicted, then the middle court, so we have three tiers. Um, I don't know if you have those tiers in Turkey or not. The middle tier, um, that, so that let's say the prostitutes got convicted, then they would be entitled to um, a defense, a free defense attorney. The defense attorney would uh, present um, the argument. And then that court would decide whether um, that solicitation, their acts counted as solicitation under that statute, um, maybe because it wasn't in the street, right? It was from the balcony. Um, and then, um, yeah, there could be, there would be a panel of five and there could be dissents as well. Um, but I don't think that question would be necessarily explicitly decided on a trial level. It would be a, a jury unless the, unless the prostitutes waive their right to a jury and the jury would just decide according to the judge's instructions, whether or not um, what they did matched, uh, counted as solicitation. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very similar to Professor Barty. So um, yes, I, I appreciate learning about, about this. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I think it's, it's five o'clock. Um, and so um, are there any questions before we close the session? Any general questions before we close the session? I see Stanzin and Rukutuja. Sorry if I said your name incorrectly. Stanzin? Yeah. yeah, just a quick question. So I was thinking, you know, whether this judgment would be different in today's, uh, like, uh, contemporary times. Because this is a very old 1960 judgment, and then uh, we have already seen how this uh, decision was interpreted and how what the judgment was given. But in today's world, in contemporary times, we know we would have to look at the uh, the condition of the sex workers also and their right to livelihood because they also need to work. So I think all this consideration would also be taken. So would it be you know would it be different like? Yeah, very good questions, Tenzin. So this is uh, what I uh, try to bring the attention of all the participants when I was discussing the Pasturi Lal case. Then when there was a majority ruling which said that uh, sovereign immunity cases uh, cannot give the remedy of compensation to the, uh, to the applicant. And subsequently I showed uh, some judgments where later on, Court, the subsequent judgment and the courts in subsequent cases did not expressly overrule the Kasturulal judgment, but they did award it the compensation. And they said that we cannot let people go remedy-less without remedy whose rights have been violated. So I completely agree with you that the way uh, sovereign immunity uh, law evolved with the change in time, change in expectation, of the people from the government and the way they work and accountability of government for the duties which can be assigned to them by the people for their care and protection. Uh, when we come to, uh, when we come to uh, the second case, uh, Smith case, which was given as an exercise, I completely agree with you that this is a very old case and this position could have uh, uh, could, could could be more appropriate in that given scenario but it, it wouldn't be appropriate to have the same rule so when we say could the judgment be different so it means we are pointing out is there a need to change the law or evolve the law and that varies with that varies uh, from country to country and from the conscience of majority people in a country to country. In India, 
we still have this rule which make uh, prostitution illegal. But in the world, there are certain countries which has evolved and they have recognized the right to livelihood of these people also. And uh, they have brought in certain the law dealing with the uh, rights of sex workers. But in Indian position is this, still we have the same law because our understanding and approach of looking at this particular uh, issue of livelihood uh, through the sex work still remains the same. But with this question, I can very well understand that you could understand the relevance and the reason of me adding and descending opinion. So maybe if not completely this judgment get overruled, maybe gradually we may start getting a descending opinion, majority still upholding the uh, verdict of Smith case, one and two descending opinion, and eventually we may get it. So time will tell. Uh, Vishal, yeah, Vishal and Rutuja, we would like to take your uh, yes, questions. Yes, ma'am. So uh, that's a very general query. Actually, I really messed up my studies class. I was really on and off joining due to network and some other issues going on. So uh, when I was re uh, trying to hear the recording, some of the participants mentioned about the uh, course material. But what 